Hey everybody, I want to welcome you back to our study in the book of Acts. Uh, where we left off last week was uh, that we saw where the church in Jerusalem started to encounter some persecution. There at the end of chapter 7, beginning of chapter 8. And we saw that uh, just to try to flee from some of that persecution, they started to spread out uh, over the surrounding region there. And we read in the scriptures that it says, wherever they went, as they were scattered, they continued to preach the good news about Jesus. And so even in the midst of what looks like something bad happening, God's purpose can, purposes continue to be accomplished because they're fulfilling the mission of the church where Jesus told them at the beginning of the book of Acts that you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that's what's starting to happen. The message is beginning to spread now. Even though it was forced out through persecution, again, it's still accomplishing God's purposes. And so that's where we're going to pick up today in chapter 8, and we're going to work our way from chapter 8 through chapter 12. Okay, so we've got a lot of ground we're going to cover today. And to lead you through this study today, I'd like you to watch a message from a minister named Matt Chandler. He is the lead minister at the Village Church, which is located in Texas. And it's going to take, kind of take us on a whirlwind tour of these four chapters. And what we'll, what we'll see is that we're going to continue to see a lot of the same themes that we've been talking about up to this point. We're going to continue to see the sovereignty of God at work, even in the midst of chaos, that God is still in control and still accomplishing His purposes through the church. We're going to see that these believers continue to be able to find joy and live joyful lives in, in this chaos and, and in the opposition that they're facing. We're also going to see, continue to see, that the mission of the church to take the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth is unstoppable. We've talked about that already as well, that it's unstoppable. No matter who the enemy is, no matter who's trying to oppose uh, the advancement of the gospel to the ends of the earth, they will not succeed. That God's purposes are going to succeed. And we'll continue to see those themes played out today in these four chapters. And I hope through, you know, through hearing this and reading through these chapters together and seeing Matt pull out some, some important truths for us today, uh, we'll be challenged to continue to trust in the sovereignty of God and continue to be committed to His mission and His task for us, which is to continue to take the gospel message to the ends of the earth and know that ultimately this is a mission that is unstoppable. Uh, so let's join Matt as he begins uh, this message today, and again, picking up in Acts chapter 8. In Jerusalem, A.D. 30, Jesus died on the cross, resurrected on the third day, and then ascended into heaven. Fifty days after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles, giving them power, purpose, and a plan. Out of joy, the church was born. Empowered by the Spirit, Peter gave his first sermon, and 3,000 hearts were transformed. Hearing, receiving, and repenting, the young church walked in unity and garnered praise. Out of joy, the gospel creates community. Peter and John then continued to spread the gospel through preaching and miracles, and the church grew by 5,000. Yet inside and outside forces threatened the unity of the church, including racial tension, a couple who held back money from the church body, and the Hellenists accusing the Hebrews of neglecting widows. But still, the church continued to multiply. In AD 31, Stephen was arrested for performing miracles and speaking truth. Standing before the council, he gave a powerful sermon connecting the Old Testament to Jesus and what he accomplished. Stephen rebuked the people for their hard hearts and refusal to acknowledge Jesus. Enraged, the people stoned Stephen, making him the first Christian martyr. In every day and age, the church faces both persecution and praise. Christians will always be misunderstood, misrepresented, maligned. But we must fight for and pray for unity to flourish within the church. Whether evangelizing to the lost, whether home groups creating new groups, whether campuses becoming autonomous churches, all multiplication comes at a cost. 
but we continue to move forward. Out of joy, the church multiplies. And so with that said, here's my very ambitious goal today. Uh, I want to cover uh, Acts chapter 8 through Acts chapter 12. Now, if you've got any history here, you've seen me take a verse and go for an hour. So don't panic, all right? Uh, we're we're going to get it in, but I want to go four verses. And, and I said in that first week that my plan in teaching through the book of Acts is to show you the movement or the spread of the gospel across the ancient world and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, we know that the gospel gets to the uttermost parts of the earth because we're here, right? I mean, you and I are in this room. We've, we've got a Bible in our lap or on our device or under our chair or whatever, but you got here because... According to Acts 1.8, the disciples received power when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they became his witnesses, first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And so today I want to just show you the movement of the gospel out of Jerusalem because I don't know how close attention you're paying, but uh, Jesus says in 1.8 that they're going to become his witnesses to the end of the earth. And, and here we are in completed chapter 7 and they're still all hanging out in Jerusalem. And so today we um, go past the walls of Jerusalem, but to get them there, um, some pretty disturbing things happen. So uh, last week I was out, Bo Hughes, uh, the campus pastor at um, the Denton campus preached. Um, you could just tell uh, that he is an extremely gifted man, extremely gifted communicator, just ferocious man of God. Uh, in fact, I was a bit nervous. I, I watched his sermon, thought it was excellent. Then I had a meeting with the elders and I thought maybe I'm the one rolling out and uh, was pleased to find out that's not what that meeting was about. Uh, and so he covered and covered well um, the death of Stephen, uh, or really the way he uh, laid it out and taught it to you. In our culture, most of us are not going to have to die for Jesus. And so he pressed on the what does it look like to live for him. And, and then what we know at the end of chapter 7 in the book of Acts, uh, Stephen is killed. He's drugged to the outskirts of town, and he is pelted with rocks until he dies. And we have our first Christian martyr. And so up until this point, it's simply been threats, a night in jail, uh, more threats, a night in jail, but no one's been killed. No one's been severely beaten. No one's been, but now that's been broached. That barrier has been passed in the murder of Stephen. And now with that, we'll pick it up in Acts chapter eight, starting in verse one. And we're just going to walk through these 12 chapters. I'll read some, tell you what we're missing, read some more, tell you what we're missing, read some more. And then I want to just pull two truths out of these four chapters. In Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says this, and Saul approved of his execution. That's the execution of Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lamed were healed, so there was much joy in the city. Now, if we just think geographically now, you've got Jerusalem and the city of Samaria is about 30 miles north of Jerusalem. It's about one or two day journey, depending on whether or not you had an animal or you were the animal that got you there, right? Uh, and so here you have now a distinctively gospel work break out in Sumeria that looks very similar to the one that occurred in Jerusalem. Now, all of a sudden, there are those professing the name of Jesus Christ. We've now got Christians in Samaria. And so when word reaches back to the apostles in Jerusalem that there's a new gospel work in Samaria, they send, and you'd see this in verse 14, they sent Peter and John to go check it out, not to verify, 
verify whether or not it could happen, but just to see, is this the same gospel? Are lives being transformed? Have we seen the promise of Jesus begun to be fulfilled? And so Peter and John go, they see that the same gospel is being preached, the same results that they saw in Jerusalem were taking place, and there was a glad celebration that the gospel began to spread. And then what you see is they work their way back to Jerusalem to report that this gospel, distinct gospel movement there in Samaria is the same gospel that was being preached in Jerusalem. Look at what they do on the way home. Verse 25. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages in the Samaritans. So now on the way back from Samaria, the city of Samaria, on their way back from Jerusalem, on that little 30 mile hike home, instead of going the direct route, uh, they would veer off and they would stop in these villages and they would preach the gospel in these villages. And then there were Samaritans that came to believe in those vi villages. And so now the, the gospel is beginning to spread. And then that closes out chapter eight, starting in chapter nine. Saul, if you'll remember Saul, last time we saw Saul, he was kicking open doors and dragging men and women into the street, arresting them and parading them, shaming them in front of people in Jerusalem to try to crush the spread and the growth of Christianity. Well, Saul of Tarsus now has papers from the ruling authorities to go to Damascus, which is about 160 miles northwest of Jerusalem, a journey of about eight or nine days, regardless of transportation. And somewhere along the way, closer to Damascus than to Jerusalem, the Bible tells us a bright light shines on Saul of Tarsus, knocks him off his horse. Jesus speaks to him audibly, and Saul of Tarsus is converted to Christianity, and then he is led into Damascus, now blinded by the light that knocked him off of his horse, and the word of the Lord came to a man named Ananias, and God tells Ananias, Saul of Tarsus is on Straight Street. Go and heal him. Ananias has some problems with this. So he brings those problems up. Uh, okay, uh, I, I know you're God, but this man has caused your people a lot of pain in Jerusalem. So I love Ananias. He's asking a question we would ask God often. Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure? Now, God's never going to go, oh man, what was I thinking? <laughs> Thank me for you. I almost jammed us all up. <laughs> so... God, in his grace, in his mercy, doesn't rebuke Ananias. He just answers him. Yeah. Yeah. He will be my voice to the Gentiles, and I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias goes, and he prays over Saul of Tarsus, and something like scales fall off of his eyes. He is baptized. He takes a little something to eat, and we'll pick it up in verse 20. And Immediately, he, he being Saul, proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name, that name being Jesus? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. And they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Now look to verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Anasius, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. Oh, that ministry was that easy. <laughs> I mean, how great would that be? You're not paralyzed anymore. Get up. That's what just happened. 
And immediately he arose and all the residents of Lida and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. So um, what, what you see happen next in this chapter of the book of Acts is there is a woman named Tabitha whose name translated means Dorcas. I just feel like I would go, call me Tabby. Uh, all right, Tabitha is fine. No need to translate my name. Just leave it in the original language. Right? My name is Tabitha. Tabby maybe, but stay away from Dorcas. And so uh, what we know about Tabitha, i.e. Dorcas, is that uh, she was a generous woman who um, sewed and, and put together cloaks for um, impoverished women. And she gets sick. And, and as she gets sick, the church knows that Peter is in Joppa. In Joppa and, and Lydda, they're not far from one another. And so they send word to get Peter for Peter to come to Joppa in order to pray for or maybe heal um, Tabitha. Now, before Peter gets there, Tabitha dies. And they wash her body and lay her in an upper room until Peter can get there. So Peter gets there, he walks upstairs where this dead body is. He prays for Tabitha Dorcas and she is raised from the dead, All right? I mean, you wanna talk about um, big time. Let's, so right now, Ananias, so you got this eight-year paralytic being healed and, and just as an encore, if you will, the Holy Spirit raises our girl, Tabitha. And then we see there in verse 42, and it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Okay, um, if you've ever seen a movie uh, about the apocalypse where some sort of virus wipes out mankind or the zombies start to wipe out mankind, there is a scene in every one of those movies that looks just like this. Um, there'll be generals and scientists and politicians in a room and there'll be a big screen that they're all looking at and they'll show us where ground zero was and then somebody, probably a scientist, will go, uh, this is eight hours, this is 16 hours, this is 36 hours, this is one week, this is two weeks, this is one month, the death of all mankind as we know it. All right, it shows kind of the globe turning red. Right, as, as then uh, extinction finally occurs and we're all zombies, except for those of us who prepped for such an event. <laughs> and then in the end, what we're watching here in these four chapters of Acts that's going to speed up and then explode starting next week in 13 and 14 is the spread of the gospel. So ground zero is Jerusalem. If you remember, we started with 120 people. And then 120 people became 3,120 people. And then that became at least 8,120 people. And then there were more added to their number day after day after day after day. And then now it's spreading. It's no longer a church in Jerusalem, but it's a church in Samaria and in Joppa and in Lydda. And it's beginning to spread. It's beginning to take over the ancient world. And then we get into chapter 10. And the gospel is now going to cross ethnic lines. And so in chapter 10, uh, the, the, the story shifts to Caesarea, which is, again, about 65 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And in Caesarea, there is a man named Cornelius of the Italian cohort, who is a god fear. He fears God. He's rejected Roman paganism, but he's not necessarily a Christian. He's just rejected um, polytheism. Uh, and he gives alms to the poor. He's a good man, uh, a, a righteous man by standards of giving to the poor and praying to God. Uh, not righteous in the way that Jesus makes us righteous, but righteous in some external behaviors of his. And so an angel appears to him, tells him to send uh, some of his men to Joppa to get Simon Peter from Simon the Tanner's house and to bring him back. At the same time, Peter has a vision, God pronouncing that there's nothing unclean. The Gentiles were historically viewed as unclean. God's word comes to Peter through food and dietary restrictions. And, and God says, there's no such thing as unclean because I made it. And if I made it, it's clean and not common. And, and so from there, Peter ends up at Cornelius's house. He preaches the gospel to Cornelius's family and friends. And then we pick it up in verse 44 of chapter 10. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fall, fell on all 
who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, that's Jews, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. So now the gospel is not just crossing city lines and county lines. It's now crossing ethnic lines as we've got our first Italian convert. And so what God said would come true when he met Abram in Genesis chapter 12 and told him he was going to bless all families on the earth. And when he confirmed it again in Genesis 15 and again in Genesis 22, and then as the law was written to make the nations glad, as the uh, prophets prophesied that there would be a day that all nations came to know the great and glorious God that we serve, as the psalmist sung about it, as Christ showed up, as the Holy Spirit empowered, we now see how happening what was testified to happen through the entire scope of scripture. And so it ends in, after this, Peter gives a defense uh, because the church at times has been a foolish institution and organization. In fact, even to this day, you'll find parts of us that are this way. Uh, but after Cornelius becomes a Christian, the, the, the church gathers together to decide whether or not God can do that. Always humorous. And so they get together. Peter staunchly defends the Holy Spirit pouring himself out on these Gentile converts. And then after his defense, we pick it up in verse 19 of chapter 11. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists. Hellenists are Greek speakers, so not Aramaic speakers uh, or Hebrew speakers like we've been dealing with. Now we're talking about Greek speakers. Preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So again, we're just watching this spread for the first seven chapters of the book of Acts. All you've heard is in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. And now we've got cities all over, ranging from 160 miles north to uh, 60 miles northwest to 40 miles south to right. It's now beginning to spread. And then in chapter 12, things get a bit gritty, starting in verse 1. Now, that time, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. Now, why four squads? This dude's a fisherman. He's not Jason Bourne. Like, why do you need four squadrons of soldiers? He's a fisherman that the Bible even tells us won the sharpest of knives. Right? I mean, at Peter's defense, did not the, the Pharisees say that these are unlearned men? And, and yet four squads of soldiers. Well, if you've been following along with us, here's why. You can't seem to keep these guys in prison. You just can't seem to keep them in there. So they locked them up, and then there was an earthquake. They were right back in the temple teaching. And then they locked him up and an angel just walked Peter out. And then so this time he's like, oh, four squads, inner cell, lock him up. And so now we've got Peter back in prison. And let me, uh, I always want to kind of step to, a, to the side when I, I say what I want, what I'm about to say is conjecture. You don't find it in the word of God, but I don't think it's hard to deduct it from the scriptures. 
um, Herod began to put a violent hand to the Christians in Jerusalem. And, and although he, he's just telling us, the Bible's just telling us that he killed uh, James, the brother of John, so one of the apostles is now physically dead. It's not a stretch of the imagination to know that there's also violence befalling the other followers of Christ in Jerusalem. And Peter has been arrested because the mob loved Herod for killing James and taking a violent hand to the church of Jesus Christ. So you have to believe that his plan for Peter is not to get him a nice house. No, it's not to put him on a fair trial. It's not to protect him from the mob. Herod is being applauded for the slaughter of Christians. He does not have strong, healthy intent for Peter. In fact, the text says that after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he was going to give him over to the people. What does a mob do? We've already seen what the mob does. The mob stones, the mob kills, the mob mains. A mob could never be satisfied. And so despite all these beautiful, miraculous things going on, what heartbreak, what loss. And then once again, four squadrons of soldiers are laughable to God. It's not like God is like, ooh, four squads, how are we going to get him out this time? <laughs> just got him out, just delivered him. And then chapter 12 ends this way. Look at verse 24. But the word of God increased and multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, that's back to Antioch, when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now, here's the two things that I wanna pull out of this text that I think become important for us to walk in the vibrancy and the vitality that I believe that God has for us in Jesus Christ. Here's the first thing, that despite all the beauty in the world and all the life in the world and all the blessing that comes from being alive, the world will at times look chaotic and out of control and there will be heartbreak and loss and suffering that feeds to us to not jive well with a God who loves us. And although it looks chaotic to us, it never looks chaotic to God, ever. Never looks out of his control. He is never going, oh no, what now? God doesn't drive an ambulance. He never shows up after something and tries to put the pieces back together. It's not how he works. There is no triage in the kingdom of God. No, God governs the chaos. We need to put roots there because the world's broken. We need to put roots there because there will be a day, if you haven't been there yet, where you are perplexed but not crushed. Where you are confused and it's hard to reconcile the goodness of God with your circumstance. So maybe you hadn't been there yet. Um, on Friday at two, I did the funeral for a beautiful 22-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl named McKenna. The first time I met McKenna, she was 17 years old, just found out she had cancer, went to her house, sat on the couch with her, and, and McKenna had that, um, that kind of spark of life that we all want, few of us have. It's that kind of just happy disposition and had a strong faith in the Lord as, long, uh, as well as the rest of her family, and, and she just seemed so glad in the Lord despite what was 14 rounds of chemo, the loss of her hair, the strong likelihood that she wasn't going to see 30, and yet with all grace and a smile, she confronted the storm that was coming for her, and that was the first time I met McKenna, and I left being marked by her joy, her gladness in the Lord, her sense of adventure, and her steadfastness in the sovereign reign of God. The last time I saw McKenna, she was laying in her hospital bed in Fort Worth with her best friend Tori cuddled up next to her, and we knew it was days if the Lord didn't do a miracle. And so on Friday at two o'clock, I stood in front of her family and friends, and, and we talked about how to reconcile these things. So maybe, maybe that doesn't cause you to be perplexed. I'll tell you, I'm perplexed 
And, and I'll tell you why. Because here's what happens in my, in that moment where you have this beautiful, happy, full of life optimist. I mean, I'm just going, Lord, take one of your grumpy ones home. <laughs> really, for, she was a happy one. It's a win-win if you take a grumpy one. They get glory, nothing to complain about there. We don't have to listen to them anymore. God, we all win if you just kill off the grumpy ones. Leave the glad-hearted ones. Leave the ones who rejoice in you. See, it's perplexing. But God reigns and rules over the chaos. And so I said at her funeral, that the reason that Christians can have joy, not happiness, but joy on a day like Friday was that we believed that God is sovereign over all things, including the day of death, and that he is good and beautiful in that governance. So how do you reconcile those two, right? I mean, how do we reconcile? Is this not probably the question that is thrown in the face of people of faith? If God is good, then how can we explain all that has gone wrong in the world? How do you explain the death of children? How do you explain disease? How do you explain these things if God is all-powerful and good? Well, here you go. I'm going to solve it. You ready? I don't know. But let me, let's talk for a second. I'm 39. All right, so I've been here for 39 years, not here on earth. And in that 39 years, I've read a ton of books and I've listened to a ton of lectures and I've read a ton of journals and I've been at the highest height of human existence in weddings, in the birth of children. I have been at the lowest lows. I've been in the house right after the paramedics leave with stillborn babies. So I've been on the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And so I've got some experience. Let me tell you all that I understand about God's governance. Only what I see in his word, but here's where humility comes in. If I'm 39 and an educated 39, all right, been traveled around the world, read a ton, Aren't I still just small and sad compared to a God that is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, has always been and will always be? How could I possibly comprehend how he's governing? So my four-year-old daughter is a beautiful little monkey. (laughs) Just have such delight in her. And she has a view of the world that is not similar to my view of the world. She has a way that she would like things to be. She has a way that she would like to eat, a time that she'd like to go to bed, a way that she would like to live. Now, I see that differently. Now, I see that differently because I'm 39 and she's four. And if such a gap exists between her and I, what must the gap be between that which is finite to that which is infinite? That which is a dew on the grass in the morning, here in the morning and gone in the afternoon to the sovereign king of glory. I had better not be able to understand how he's governing or he's way too small of a God for me to worship. Like if I go, well, here's why. No, we just trust that he's good. How can we trust that he's good in such difficult days? Because the cross, come on, the cross. God's initiating love, the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf for the glory of God is the clanging of God's goodness in our heart and soul. He is for me, not against me. I see that in Jesus. He is for me, not against me. Otherwise, Christ wouldn't have come. He is for me, not against me. So McKenna's death's not punitive. It wasn't about God's wrath or God's anger. There was no wrath for McKenna. It had all been absorbed by Jesus Christ and the cross. There was none left to be poured out on her or her family. They're all believers. No, God was doing something. (laughs) Gosh, I wish I could tell you what it is. Because seriously, I have a whole list of people in my office that I'd rather the Lord take home. I mean, you laugh because you don't know you're probably on that list. (laughs) Now, let let me say this to you. And, and I want, again, you to have your confidence built in this. For the believer in Christ, so not humanity, 
For the believer in Jesus Christ, bad days, regardless of how horrific, regardless of how soul-crushing, heart-failing, overwhelming those days are, bad days for the Christian will always ultimately lead to better days on into the best of days. Now, I'll tell you why that doesn't sit well with us and why we have such a hard time with some of these things. Uh, Our culture, in every measurable possible, has no foresight to see tomorrow. It's just today. What I want today and what I want to enjoy today, I mean, all you need to look at is the level of debt we carry. All right, how easily we'll bury ourselves in debt. Why? Because it's about today. It's about what we want right now. Look at how we eat food. I mean, in almost every meal you buy in the store, the the way we're tempted, the way we're drawn in is how quick it is to prepare. Five minutes, ding. (laughs) Are you a busy mom? Here's how, you know, it's like fish sticks. Just throw them in the back, all right? You can just (laughs) cook them in the heater of your car and toss them back there, right? I mean, this is us. It's right now. I need it to be easy now. I don't need there to be any difficulty now. I need it to be. We are slaves to the God of comfort and today. And he keeps betraying us and we keep worshiping him. But for the Christian, our hope is in tomorrow. Not today, tomorrow. In fact, Jesus said it. In this life, you will have trouble. He's not a liar. Shouldn't surprise you when you have trouble. Jesus said, in this life, you'll have trouble. But take heart, he said, for I have overcome the world. So let me read you some of my favorite verses about bad days giving way to better days and ultimately perfect days. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. So I know that all things are working together for my good and his glory. Now, there are a couple of reasons why I'm really grateful for being diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and having to do 18 months of chemotherapy and having radiation pumped into my brain. And this moment is one of those. Because I'm not standing here with some sort of theory that all things work together for the good of those who love him. That's not a theory of mine. Like I know it to be true. Well, of course you do, Chandler. You're alive. Well, listen, if I was dead, is that a net loss for me? As a Christian? If I'm, if I'm to die, is that, oh no, I got robbed from so many beautiful things. You know, ghetto those beautiful things are in light of what's coming for those of us who are children of God. Well, you must not understand grandbabies. Well, you must not understand the glory of God because it would make grandchildren pale in comparison to the light of his glory and grace. Make it worth it in a second. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Here's one of my favorites, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. This has a sentence in it that's one of my favorite sentences in the Bible. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by Life. I love that sentence. What is mortal might be swallowed up by what is life. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here in this text is that this body and this place that we live, this is camping. This isn't home. This isn't our home. This body, we want to be more clothed than this. What does that mean? This body breaks down. This body gets sick. This body needs rest. This body feels pain. This body gets tired. This body, right? So we groan to be out of this. And that this world, this house, this is a tent. It's not our home. Now, for some of you who love to go camping, you're like, awesome. 
But I don't think that's Paul's point here. Paul's point is kind of like how Lauren, my wife, sees camping, which is it had better be a Hilton at least. (laughs) All right, so my wife's version of camping is I had better be able to call someone whenever and get food, and I better be able to lock the door. And so maybe you married a girl that dips and shoots a 223. I was not graced with that, all right? Uh, If you were, praise God, all right? Uh, When the zombie apocalypse comes, she can help you hunt and you will take care of me and and my wife, hopefully, uh, as we are ill-prepared for such uh, a cataclysmic event. But I want you to hear what he just said here. When, When people talk about what is mortal, they're talking about life. But what Paul just said here is what is mortal will be consumed by what? Life. So there's a type of life that is greater than the life that you and I are walking in now. Here's the point of the text. This is not our home, and we should not expect to feel perfectly at peace and perfectly comfortable here. It's in our home. Our home is coming. So until then, we groan. Until then, we want more than we have. But that has to be satisfied by God and God alone. And here's how John puts it in Revelation 21. (coughs) In Revelation 21, starting in verse one, it says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Listen to this. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed Away, when the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 65 began to prophesy the same thing, here's the way he put it. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. And so I said at McKenna's funeral to her family and to her friends that there will come a day where the sorrow we rightfully feel today, we no longer remember that it doesn't seem like we lost anything. So 10,000 years from now, there won't be among McKenna's family or McKenna herself or her best friend, Tori, or the rest of her family members. Oh, we lost something. There'll be no remembrance of that at all. Now, am I saying that you won't remember anything about life on earth? No, not at all. In fact, if we had time to get into Isaiah 65, it becomes clear that we will remember those things that cause us to rejoice in the Lord and in his governance of our lives. But anything that would rob us of that affection can no longer be remembered. The bad days will always lead to better days that will ultimately lead to perfect days. But for now, you can be assured of this. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, he has overcome the world. I I continue, I continue to have my mind blown at how readily evangelicals accept prosperity gospel teaching. It, It is so baffling to me that we would believe this Now, I know some of you are like, well, Chandler, I've heard those guys, they they say God wants to bless us. Listen, God does want to bless you. He loves you deeply. In fact, he loves you so deeply, there will be times he blesses you with great difficulty so that you might know what you need to know all the more and might not have what you desperately want that might hurt you. See, God loves you. He loves you enough to, according to Hebrews 12, discipline you as sons and scourge all of those he calls children. No, don't despise the dark day. The Lord's in it. Now here's the good news. The Lord will sustain us regardless of circumstance. He he just will. I'm just so confident of that in the number of hospital rooms and funeral homes I've been in right now that, that the Lord will sustain on that day. If you've got things in your mind like, I just can't even imagine. Well, first of all, stop trying to imagine. Why would you do that? 
Secondly, when you need it, it'll be there. That grace won't show up before you need it. It shows up when you need it. But I'm telling you, there's nothing, nothing you could imagine that the Lord wouldn't hold you up under if he governed you through it. Now, am I saying God's the author of evil? Absolutely not. He can't be. He's not. But the Bible is clear that what is meant for evil, he will take and mean it for good. And so hear me, although the world will look chaotic to us, it never looks chaotic to God. And despite all the blessing that we see in Acts, I want you to keep in mind that Stephen was killed. Stephen was killed. All right, think about it. Stephen's primary ministry was caring for widows. He taught adult seven Sunday school. Why do you kill that guy? You have to be gentle if you're going to work with elder. You're not rough and... Right? And James is killed with the sword and Saul has his life threatened and has to escape down the city wall in a basket. And Peter just keeps getting arrested. And these are real men, many of them with real families. That's not conjecture. We know from the Bible that Peter has a mother-in-law. Peter has a wife, has a family. And yet this man, when all said and done, is gonna be crucified upside down. God's at work in the chaos. Now, the second thing I want to pull from this, uh, these four chapters, and it's much shorter. The mission of God to declare the work of Jesus to the ends of the earth cannot be stopped regardless of foe. So what you see happening in uh, these four chapters and what we've seen happen throughout Christian history is those who wish to destroy the Christian faith and the harder they press, the more it grows. I mean, let's just talk about some of the governments. Can we just agree that Rome's pretty legit? Now, how many of you, anybody been to Rome? Okay, so let's chat. Those of you who've been, if you haven't been, let me just tell you, there are roads in Rome that were built 2,000 years ago that they still drive on. We can't fix the parking lot at our (laughs) Chick-fil-A. We can't get it done. It's like a sinkhole. Somebody's going to die over there. And yet the Romans 2,000 years ago built roads that we still drive on. We built roads just 20 years ago and are having to shut down the highway to rebuild them. Rome ruled from India to England. Or for you, India to England. (laughs) And they tried to crush it, snuff it out, and destroy it. They fed our brothers and sisters to lions. They boiled them alive. They sawed them in two. They beheaded them. They crucified them upside down by the thousands. And history tells us that by 351 AD, 51.3% of the Roman Empire or 350 million people were believers in Jesus Christ and called themselves followers of the way. What about the communist in Russia or in other parts of the world? See, the harder you press on Christianity, the more it flourishes, the more you beat on it, the more it grows. In fact, I'll say this to you. I believe that you and I are in far greater spiritual danger than any of our brothers and sisters in Iraq and Iran and in other parts of the world where the cost of following Jesus might end in your physical death or in the torture of your own life or those you know and love. Because there's no great angst coming into worship this morning. There's no, please God, encourage my spirit. Please God, protect us. Please God, move. Please God, no, it's just comfort and cushy chair and give me a good coffee. And man, it's a little cold in here and it's dangerous. It can just be an add-on. But my point is this. Whether or not Christianity sits at the center of a culture, has been pushed to the margins, or is illegal, the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be stopped. 